Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining the session. My name is Bastian Blössel, and I'm a postdoc at the Secure Mobile Networking Lab at TU Darmstadt in Germany. And I'm also involved in the GNU Radio project, which is an open source real time signal processing framework that we'll also use today to implement our own receiver. So, the idea for this session is to provide a brief and hands on introduction to software defined radio, presenting a workflow where we um, reverse engineer and decode an unknown wireless signal. And I think the interesting aspect about this workflow is that it uses popular and well-maintained software, and it's really um, very low level and looking at the nitty gritty details. That means we look at the physical waveform and derive the parameters of it. And just saying this because I'm aware that there is um, software that would allow to automate parts of this process and that would allow us to also work on a bit of a higher level. But um, I still think it makes a lot of sense to at least go through this process once to know what's going on under the hood. Okay, so to make sure that we are all on the same page and also to have this a bit self-contained, I want to give a very brief introduction to software-defined radio. And I usually like to introduce software-defined radios as a piece of hardware together with a piece of software. And conceptually, this is very similar to audio processing where you have speakers and a microphone that is connected to an audio interface. And this allows you to send and receive acoustic signals. In the case of an SDR, we have a radio front end with an antenna and A to D converters, and it allows us to digitize the electromagnetic waves. And again, this is combined with a piece of software where we implement our digital signal processing and implement our own transceivers. This implementation, implementation can be on an FPGA, a GPU, or a CPU, or a combination of all of this. But today we'll only look at the CPU uh, implementations based on GNU Radio, because they are by far the most accessible ones, even though they then have limitations with regard to delay, chitter, and high performance, high throughput applications. Okay, so if we stick to the comparison between audio and radio once again, then I think there are two major differences. For one, with radio, we consider much bigger bandwidth. As a human, we hear between approximately 0 and 20 kilohertz, so we have a bandwidth of 20 kilohertz. And um, with RF, already, for example, a 20 megahertz Wi-Fi channel that was already around in 2000 or so um, was a factor of 1,000. And now we consider 40, 80, 160 megahertz channels. And the same is for, goes for cellular, basically. And what it means is we have to sample faster to capture the full bandwidth of the signal, which results in a lot of data which has to be processed, and this can be a big challenge. And the second difference is that radio is usually not sent around zero, but upconverted to a certain frequency band. And this is what I try to depict here in this simple figure, where we have a real value signal, and that's the orange part, and it's real valued, that means it is symmetric around zero, and it has a given bandwidth, and is sent on a certain band, a frequency band. So that could be 20 megahertz bandwidth of a Wi-Fi signal that is sent on 2.4 gigahertz, for example. Now the question is how we sample this and how the SDR processes this to, to receive the signal. And while direct sampling is about to become feasible, um, the vast majority of um, SDR hardware out there still has an analog down conversion stage. And what you could do in theory is you could down convert the signal as depicted here at the bottom on the left, that it's still a real signal centered at around zero. And in this case, you would have to sam sample the real valued signal with twice the bandwidth. And I guess this is what rings a bell, what everybody knows. It's the sampling theorem that says um, to capture a signal fully, you have to sample it twice the bandwidth. But this is actually not what an SDR is doing, and this was irritating me a bit in the beginning. Because an SDR down converts the signal um, centered at around zero, and but it's no longer symmetric. So that means it's now a complex analytic signal. And it's what we call the complex baseband representation of a signal. And now in this case, you have uh, you only have to sample with a bandwidth, but have complex samples. So it, in a sense, it still makes sense because it's the same amount of information, it's the same data rate, it's just a different representation in the end. For the hardware, that means you can either have one A to D converter or two running at half the rate. And this is what the SDR is doing. So basically what it means for you is when you turn on your SDR, and it will down convert to complex baseband, it will stream complex numbers to you 
And if you set a sample rate to 10 megasamples per second, you get 10 megahertz worth of bandwidth. Okay, and this is already everything I wanted to say as an introduction. And now we switch to the more hands-on part of the session. So today I have a HackRF1 on my desk, but nothing we do is in any way specific to this particular device. So you could just use any other SDR radio for it. I just think the HackRF is a good example of an affordable software-defined radio. It's about 300 euros that can be used to send and receive signals of uh, up to 20 megahertz of bandwidth. And it basically covers everything below six gigahertz. So that's for this price, a pretty flexible device. I think. And the first thing I want to do is use it as a spectrum analyzer. It basically allows us to explore the signals around us, and kind of scroll through the spectrum, let's say. And for this, I want to use phosphor. And the interesting thing about phosphor is not only that it looks nice, but also that it uses the GPU to accelerate uh, signal processing. So in this case, you can see that it found my NVIDIA GPU and uses it to calculate the FFT and render this plot. And the FFT obviously is used to um, convert between time domain as uh, streamed by the SDR to the frequency domain representation that is now shown on the screen. Okay, so let's dig a bit deeper into um, Phosphor. First of all, we can increase the sample rate. As I said, this device supports up to 20 megahertz. So now we see a bit more. And now we can just scroll a bit through the spectrum and see if there's something interesting that pops up. Okay, here at about 1.88 gigahertz, we see that should be a UMTS cell, so 3G cellular. We go down, further down. Here are some GSM cells, so we see this more narrow signals. And if we go further down, yeah, here, for example, we have some LTE cell. And as I mentioned, we have 20 megahertz of sample rate. We see 20 megahertz of uh, bandwidth, and this is a 10 megahertz uh, LTE carrier. So for example, if we now uh, reduce the sample rate, it's like zooming in on the signal. So exactly, just to give you a bit of impression how that works. And um, now also, I guess LTE is a good example to demonstrate why Phosphor is not only eye candy, but actually it also has um, some advantages because for example, here um, we can see the, the LTE carrier in great detail and we can even see, uh, uh, get an idea of the resource blocks and which are used and which are free in this case. So this is clearly an advantage of uh, Phosphor when we are really able to process all the data that we receive from the SDR without dropping something. Okay, so what else can we have a look at? For example, we can go to uh, 100 megahertz, where there's FM radio, and with, if we go to close to 100 megahertz, then we can see with our 20 megahertz, we can see all radio stations basically, because it spans from 88 megahertz to 108 megahertz, so there's exactly 20 megahertz, we see all of it. Okay, so that was the first impression um, of Phosphor, but what do we want to use it for today in the tutorial? So I want to use it to decode a wireless car key fob. And I got one of those um, for my car and I was curious how they work. You can see these fobs are from Hella. I bought another one that I cracked open just to see what's inside. It was not too interesting, but still. Um, yeah, today we want to use the my actual one. And the first thing, obviously, uh, the question we have to answer is so on which frequency is it sending? And Hella, in this case, it made it very easy because it's printed on. Uh, on the key fob itself. In this case, it's on the 4.430 megahertz. In the US, they sell the same key fobs. I think it's the 330 megahertz band. Okay, so let's go to Phosphor. Or maybe I'll, let's look at everything. Here you can see my key fob. Now we first tune to um, 433 megahertz, for example. And then um, when I press it, yeah, I can clearly see it in the spectrum, looking very nice. Now what we can have a look at is, for example, setting different gains. In this case, okay, it's looking pretty good, but let's see what happens if we increase the gain. And at some points, you see the noise flow goes up a bit and we get copies of the signal. So in this case, it's clearly overdriving it. You don't want to avoid this. So you usually try to reduce the gain. Uh, you increase it as much as possible, but you want to avoid overdriving it. 
Okay. So we found our signal looking pretty good. It's I suspect it's pretty narrow band. So the next step would be to record the signal so that we can inspect it more closely because in this case we just see it's there we can we can approximate its bandwidth but that's basically everything so since we are oversampling here currently like crazy we can reduce the sample rate a bit let's say we go down to the 8 megahertz or so like this and then um, we can record the signal and fortunately this uh, um, Spectrum Analyzer already supports this. Here we can make a recording. Here's a recording button. And now I have to be a bit fast because recording it uh, with this high bandwidth produces quite a bit of data. So I will now press open, close, and the trunk button each three times and then stop the record. Okay. So here, start the recording. One, two, three, one. Two, three, one, two, three, and stop it. Okay, so now we recorded the signal and can now move on and have a inspect it more closely um, to figure out the system parameters. Okay, so now we can go ahead and perform an offline analysis of the samples that we just recorded with Phosphor. And for this, I want to start in Spectrum, which is an awesome tool that was just created from for that. We can open our file in the temp folder. And usually the only thing we'd have to adjust is the sample rate. But in this case, it already guessed it from the file name probably because 800, uh, 8 megahertz is already correct. And what we have now is a spectrum over time. So that means we have time on the x-axis and spectra frequency on the y-axis. So it goes from minus four to four megahertz. That's also fine. And with uh, regard to phosphor, where we had this waterfall blot, it's kind of 90 degrees rotated. Okay, so let's just start and scroll a bit through the spectrum. And there we clearly see some transmission. Mm -hmm. As we can see, it's not really in the center, but it's kind of offset. It seems to be like, um, 1.1234 um, 1, 5 so 1.45 megahertz offset was the higher frequencies which also kind of um, matches with what we've seen in phosphor that was also not in the center but a bit shifted um, towards the right so this probably is our key fob we can now zoom a bit out and uh, um, but uh, that's i view of it so let's see here it starts here Okay, and there are transmission, small gap, transmission, and then a small gap and another one. And this is kind of nearly back to back. Um, I couldn't press the key this fast. So probably it means that when I press the key, it sends out the opening or closing the code um, multiple times just to increase the chance that my car actually receives it and then acts upon it. So that means I would expect that one key press corresponds to such a burst, let's call it, of transmissions. Um, you remember the three keys, I pressed each of them three times. So if we now scroll through this, um, we should see nine of those bursts. So let's go first. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then that's it. Okay. So at least that already makes some sense. Then let's have a closer look at the actual signal. So we zoom in a bit and we can see that it looks like there is something, like there's a carrier and there's nothing, there's a carrier. Well, it's turning it on and off. So it suggests that this is uh, on off keying, a very simple modulation technique that is on the other hand, really common in this uh, frequency band and for this type of devices. For example, wireless weather stations or so would also often use it. Okay, so when this is on off keying, we're mainly interested in the amplitude of the signal. And fortunately, in Spectrum allows us to add a derived plot um, to, the, to this. One of the options is add amplitude plot. So I do it and we can select part of the spectrum where we are interested in and filter it out. 
And then if we scroll to the bottom, we hopefully see a plot of the amplitude. With a filter here, we can adjust it a bit more. Yeah, like this, it looks good, I'd say. And what do we see here? A very regular pattern on, off, on, off, on, off. Uh, yeah, it goes on for quite some time. And I mean, it's clear that doesn't convey any information. I, uh, at least I hope it doesn't that this doesn't open my car. Um, but this is usually a synchronization sequence like preamble or sync word, however you want to call it. And I expect that the actual data is in someone later. This is incredibly long. Very long. Okay, so this uh, seems to be the more interesting part of the transmission. Can we zoom out even further? Yeah. Okay, so we see that here the long preamble and then here something is happening. Now um, we can have a bit of a closer look, uh, enabling cursors. And this gives us an overlay where we can easily measure things. So place it around this and then add um, a bit more and try to align them um, with the symbols that we see here. This looks pretty good, I would say. Yeah. Okay, so now what do we see now? We have this preamble sequence or synchronization sequence, and then here it starts to, that there are sometimes two consecutive uh, zeros and ones. But also if we have a bit of closer look at it, what's really strange is that there are only at max two consecutive zeros and ones and actually this is strange because we would assume there is some security involved and there should be kind of an equal uh, distribution and independent of zeros and ones it doesn't seem to be the case here at least um so but one of these uh, explanations for this is that um, the key for probably uses manchester encoding and the um specific thing about Manchester encoding is that it's not each of these uh, symbols that we see here that encodes a one or a zero, but that you always have to consider pairs of them. And with Manchester, it's guaranteed that in, um, in each pair, there's a, either an upwards or downwards transition um, between those symbols, and this then encodes a zero or a one. What that means for us is, okay, and we have a closer look here, we see that here are two consecutive zeros and here are two consecutive ones. And that can be that this is a pair of this Manchester encoding bit bit. So it means we have to align it like this, that this is a pair with a downward transition, this is a pair with an upward transition. So it's very clear how we have to align it. And this is why Manchester is often called a self-synchronizing code because uh, just from have, seeing a gap with two consecutive zeros and ones, we know exactly where we have to align our bit, basically. Okay. So this is already most of the things we uh, wanted to find out about our signal here within Spectrum. Um, one thing we still have to have a look is um, these um, parameters that are derived um, from our grid. And we can see that there's a simple period of... 295, let's say, microseconds, and a simple rate of 3.39 kiloboard. Um, so as I said, the symbols, uh, the, the bit rate would be half of that. But yeah, so we can um, basically, we have to write down these parameters and remember them. To summarize, what we learned here is there's our signal, it's offset 1.45 megahertz and towards the higher frequencies. It's on off keying. On top of it, it uses a Manchester encoder, and the baud rate is 3.39 kilobaud. Okay, so with this knowledge, we can now go ahead and try to build a receiver with GNU Radio. Okay, so we derived the most important parameters of our signal and can now go ahead and implement the receiver in GNU Radio. I already started the graphical user interface to GNU Radio and started to put something together. Noradio supports this concept of blocks that can be connected to form a flow graph. And a flow graph is, uh, is then the thing that can be actually run and executed. So the whole thing here would be one flow graph. 
In our case, we start with reading from a file. Obviously, this is the IQ sample file that we just had a look at. So we're read, reading this in and looping it all the time. By default, this would happen as fast as IO the disk uh, permits. So we throttle it down a bit. And in this case, I adjusted a rate of eight mega samples per second so that it matches the rate of the hardware. And speaking about the hardware, it is very easy to disable these blocks. So they, we gray them out and enable a block that interfaces the hardware, so the HackRF, so that we could switch between either reading from the file samples or really reading samples uh, in real time from the hardware. So this is uh, very nice. Um, but for now, when we really still work on the receiver, we use the file source because then we don't have to press the button all the time and it's just easier to handle. Okay, so the first block that actually does some signal processing um, is the frequency exciting fear filter here. And it does quite a lot of things. The reason is not that we don't like modularity, but it's just efficient to do all of this in one step. So what it does is it, first of all, compensates for this offset. It moves the uh, key fob signal down towards the center. So it compensates for this 1.45 megahertz. Then it also low pass filters because it's just a narrow signal and it can filter out all the noise at the edges of the spectrum. And finally, the signal is heavily, heavily oversampled. So um, we decimate, so that means we reduce the sample rate by a factor of 32. And that means the input rate of this block here is eight mega samples per second, and the output is eight mega samples, uh, mega samples per second divided by 32. Okay, now we can already have a look and see how that looks after this stage. And for this, I added a frequency sync, so we can still have a look at the spectrum. Here we see um, the low pass filter, so we only get some noise in the middle. And then from time to time, we see these transmissions. And these transmissions are now really pretty close to zero, so we compensated for this um, big offset. Okay, so this is what we expected after this stage. So now we want to decode our on-off keying signal. And for this, we first of all calculate the magnitude of these complex numbers, because we're only interested in the magnitude. And here it's interesting to have a look at the color of the ports of this block. The input is blue, which indicates that this is a complex uh, samples, and the output is um, orange, which indicates that this is a loads or real values. So that makes sense. And then after that, we only are interested if it's on or off. So what we can do is just uh, define a threshold and everything above the threshold is a one, everything below the threshold is a zero. This is exactly what the block does. I already had a look at the um, signal levels and adjusted the threshold so that it works pretty good um, with our recording. With a real system, you probably want to have the dynamic so that you adjust the threshold based on the preamble values, for example, so that you, um, if the signal gets weaker, that you adjust the threshold accordingly. But for our use case now, that's good enough and um, can be improved later. Okay, so let's also have a look at this. Um, and see if it works. And here, let's see if we can stop. Oh, yeah. um, we have here two signals. The red one is the one of the output of the complex to magnitude block. Here it's kind of the analog signal where um, there's some noise. And the blue one is then the binary signal that only changes between zero and one. And we can see that when we see here um, this transitions uh, of the red line, then also it switches from zero to one. So that means the threshold is, uh, is working. And now and we'd also uh, only need a block that looks at these binary values and uh, implements a decoder for our key fob. Obviously, um, yeah, GNU Radio just provides the base, the blocks that are very common in every SDR application. But here we reach a point where we just need something custom for this particular technology. So that means we have to build, uh, implement our own GNU radio block. And that's what we'll do in the next step. Okay, so as a last step, um, we now create our own GNU radio block that can then decode the signals from the car key fob. And with GNU radio, this can be done with an out of tree module. And usually this requires tons and tons of boilerplate, but fortunately GNU radio shops with a tool that helps us um, with this. And this is called gr underscore mod tool. And we can say, just say new mod call it keyfob, and then we have a new gr keyfob um, directory. This already creates 
quite a lot of stuff, but actually it's not really interesting because there's no module and uh, no block. And we just add one, um, call it decoder. Mm, say it's a sync block because only has an input, but doesn't add, we don't add an output. Do it in C++, it's a bit faster. And no arguments, everything's hard-coded. And also no uh, QA test for now. Okay, so now we see what files were created. And the most interesting one is the impl.cc, the coder impl.cc. This is where all the DSP is going. So let's open this block in our editor. Um, yeah, and the template is really so nice that it also includes pragmas with messages telling you, oh, look, here you have to <laughs> write some code. Um, basically, it tells us we have to set the input type. And since we are already kind of in binary domain, we can just say this is just a byte. And then the other thing we have to change is the work function. This is very famous for GNU Radio. Usually the work function is what implements the signal processing where you get a, this input, you get an input buffer and you have output buffers and you just uh, implement all this logic that um, takes the input samples, does something, produces the output samples. In our case, it's very easy. We just cast the input samples to um, the bytes and then implement the Manchester decoder. And for this, I already prepared something because we don't have the time to do it live and it would probably be a bit embarrassing to see me um, type while talking. And I implemented it pretty ugly, but in a way that I only now change the work function and nothing else. This is just to can put it in the stream and that you know that it's not like I have to change uh, something at 10 different places. So this implements the Manchester decoder and the logic is quite simple. So we cast the, the input items to um, our bytes. We iterate over all of them. And then we check how long strings of zeros and ones we see. Either this corresponds then to a short pulse, a long pulse, which means there's two consecutive zeros or two consecutive ones, or something else. If something else, we just ignore it, assume it's maybe noise or something, just do nothing. If um, we see it's a long one, we know we are misaligned. We don't output something, we just shift our kind of bit border by um, the symbol width. If we only see, we see these um, short pulses, um, two consecutive ones with a positive edge in between, we output a one. If we have two consecutive ones with a negative in edge in between, we output a zero. And this is basically all the logic. And the difference of the short or the, the length of the short and long pulses, it's basically derived from the sample rate and the um, symbol duration that we um, uh, wrote down in, in Spectrum. So we have here we already have the whole implementation of our decoder. And now we have to do two additional steps. Apart from this C++ implementation, New Radio also has Python bindings. We have to generate them. This can be done um, also with GR module, um, bind the coder. So um, this should create the Python bindings for it. And finally, um, all blocks come with uh, a YAML file. And the YAML file is basically the description for the GUI. And it tells us how many input ports it has and so on and so forth. So this YAML file is in the GRC directory. And here we can create a very simple one. We don't have any parameters. Our block, our block also doesn't have any outputs. We just have a single input that we have to fill in. So we call it in. It's a stream block, means this is a, just a normal buffer. The data type is called byte, vector length is one, and we don't need this. So basically this tells us how a block can be instantiated. So we just import our module and then call the constructor and that's everything. And each of these blocks only has one input. So this is everything we have to do in GNU Radio to um, have our own block. Now it's just like a normal CMake project. Um, we can configure, build and install it. And then hopefully it shows up in the GUI. So. So it's installed. Okay, here's our flow graph. And now we got this new um, category here, 
and it says key fob and we only have a decoder block and we can add it to the flow graph as input these uh, lila um, pink uh, violet ones correspond to a, a byte can connect it and i already changed the file source to not repeat so we play our recorded signal only once and then let's see what happens if we get some zeros and ones out of it okay so something is happening these long strings of zeros correspond to the preamble and other than that we got quite a lot of bits and you know, let's just use the editor to have a look at them um, we can mm, delete the leading zeros basically um, okay let's list us with this and there we can see okay at least it looks a bit like they make a bit of sense we uh, compare it here these three are the same so this was one button press resulting in the same key sequence that's nice the second one third one so we should see nine of those here were only two transmissions yeah so that makes sense so here we have all nine now um the other thing we can have a look at we know the first three one were all ones where we op try to open the car and if you look a bit closer at the sequence we can see that the command or the button that we press is indicated at the uh, in the last bytes of the transmissions so for example here we see this first three were all closing the second three were all the trunk uh, button and the other one was to open so we can see we received something otherwise it uh, wouldn't happen that you out of chance receive the same sequence several times we can see that they have all the same length that makes a lot of sense we can see that um that also the uh, type of the um, key is indicated in this bits and so we could work from there so um, the rest is hopefully not so easy to derive because somewhere in there is a rolling code that uh, is then the secret um, so that only this key can open the car okay so we really rushed through this whole process now i still hope that there was something in for you and if you still have questions then feel free to ask them during the q a other than that i thank you very much for your attention and yeah bye bye